Hello, and welcome to the Science of Terragenesis. Episode 3, Surface Temperature. Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn. Today we're going to be talking about the first terraforming metric in terragenesis, surface temperature. This is arguably the most important factor in determining whether a planet or moon is habitable. A human can carry water in a canteen and oxygen in a tank, but if the planet has an environment that would melt lead or freeze ethanol, you won't be able to survive without heavy-duty protection. Ironically, surface temperature wasn't even included in the original version of Terragenesis. When I made my first pass at building the game, temperature and pressure were the same metric. Increase your pressure to warm up your planet, decrease your pressure to cool it down. There was no visible ice on the surface, and that entire section of the tech tree and facilities list didn't exist. I only added temperature about halfway through development when I realized that I'd eventually want to add worlds that had low temperatures but thick atmospheres like Titan. A world's surface temperature is the key to a ton of different aspects of habitability, both in terragenesis and in real life. Not only is it the difference between a pleasant day in the park and a horrible death through ice or fire, it also helps define whether liquid water can exist on the surface, how much weather activity there is in the atmosphere, and even how much of an atmosphere a planet with a given amount of gravity can hold on to. The higher the temperature, the more active the atmospheric molecules, and the easier it is for them to escape the gravity well, which can lead to gradual loss of certain gases over time. Earth's surface temperature is about 14 degrees Celsius, or about 287 Kelvin. Of course, that's a global average, both across the surface of the Earth and over the course of the year. Temperatures on Earth can vary wildly, from the equatorial deserts to the perpetually frozen poles. It's also complicated by axial tilt and hydrological cycles, which are not represented in terragenesis, and by the atmospheric retention of heat, which is. In terragenesis, we use millikelvin as our standard unit of heat. The Kelvin scale is generally used in scientific circles. It's very similar to the Celsius scale, except adjusted up by 273, so that zero, rather than representing the freezing point of water, instead represents absolute zero, the lowest possible temperature at which all molecular movement stops. That means that in the Kelvin scale, you will never see a negative number. Millikelvin, meanwhile, simply means the Kelvin scale multiplied by 1,000. So if Earth's average temperature is 14 degrees Celsius, we add 273 to convert to Kelvin, making it 287 Kelvin, or 287,000 millikelvin. We use millikelvin just so the size of the goal in terragenesis is roughly in line with our pressure goal of 100,000 pascals and our oxygen goal of 210,000 parts per million. Easier for the player to keep track of it that way. So if the surface of the Earth is 287 Kelvin, how do the other planets stack up? Well, Mars is a bit chilly, but still within a reasonable range, around 210 Kelvin, which is to say negative 63 degrees Celsius or negative 81 Fahrenheit. That's a few dozen degrees warmer than the coldest recorded temperature on Earth. Pluto knocks it out of the water, though, at just 33 Kelvin. And on the other end of the scale, Mercury, being right up in the sun's face, gets up to 700 Kelvin, and Venus's choking clouds bring it up to a scorching 735 Kelvin, which is hot enough to melt lead. There are a bunch of ways that humans could deliberately influence the surface temperature of a planet or moon, and while they would all be colossal engineering challenges in their own right, they're undeniably the easiest aspects of terraforming to undertake. After all, Unlike pressure or oxygen or water, there's a giant source of energy constantly radiating heat out into our solar system, the sun. Most of the proposed methods for raising or lowering a planet's surface temperature, at least on a large scale, come down to controlling the amount of sunlight it receives. In terragenesis, 
there are three technologies used to increase surface temperature and three to decrease it. On the increasing side, we start with a heating cluster. This is literally the kind of thing you might find on a cold restaurant patio, a cluster of small structures designed to release heat over a small area. It's unlikely to have any impact on a global scale, but it's a nice way to start warming up an icy world like Mars. After that, the players can move on to boreholes. These are essentially small man-made volcanoes, holes dug deep into the surface to release heat from the upper mantle. And finally, the largest heat raising facility is the orbital mirror, which is exactly what it sounds like. A huge mirror in orbit designed to redirect the sun's light back onto the surface of the planet, essentially multiplying the amount of sunlight striking the surface. Such a mirror could be focused or unfocused, depending on the needs of the particular community on that world. On a world like Venus, however, these facilities would only add to the problem. There, the goal would be to lower the temperature, not raise it, so we have a different set of facilities to work with. The most basic is called the cooling plant, which siphons heat from the surface and turns it into electricity for the settlers to use. Like the heating cluster, it's unlikely to transform the whole planet on its own, but it's a decent place to start. After that comes the aerostat platform, a type of floating structure that could house buildings or even entire cities above the surface of Venus, and which would reflect back some of the sunlight before it reached the ground. Since Venus's atmosphere is thicker than seawater on the surface, we could literally float above it just like ships on the ocean, and intriguingly, there is a certain altitude in the atmosphere above Venus where both the temperature and air pressure are Earth normal and survivable by humans. You'd need an oxygen tank and protection from the sulfuric acid in the air, but it'd still be a beautiful Tuesday in April compared to standing on the surface. The last heat-reducing facility in Terragenesis is the solar shade, sort of an inversion of the orbital mirror, which is designed to reduce or even eliminate the sunlight reaching a portion of the planet's surface. Of course, there is one more thing you can build that will radically alter your planet's temperature, the Soleta. The Soleta is an array of orbital mirrors and solar shades, which is designed to automatically manage your surface temperature, moving you 10% toward your goal every minute. This is one of the most popular systems in Terragenesis, and features heavily in Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy. Whether in Terragenesis or in real life, getting your planet to the right temperature is the first step toward terraforming it for human habitability. It'll be a huge and complicated process, but altering the environment of any planet will likely start with adjusting its temperature. As soon as your tech isn't freezing or melting the moment you go outside, you can really get to work transforming the planet into a new Earth. Next week, we'll be diving into the next major terraforming metric and one closely related to surface temperature, atmospheric pressure. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes. And in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, Discord, YouTube, everywhere. You can also check us out at edgeworksentertainment.com and terragenesisgame.com. And don't forget to leave a review for the podcast. It really does help. And if you haven't played it yet, be sure to check out Terragenesis, it's a free download on iOS or Android and coming soon to Windows. Happy terraforming.